Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, The Spirit of Pharaoh. You've heard the spirit of Python. You've heard about the spirit of Jezebel. And you've even heard the spirit of Elijah. Today, I want to speak to you about the spirit of Pharaoh. Turn with me, please, to our scripture found in Exodus chapter 1, verse 18 through 14. Then we'll skip down to verse 22. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Dropping down to verse 22. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. The spirit of Pharaoh attaches itself to the ruling class. It influences those who are in power. That is, the ones making the laws and making decisions for the rest of the country. In other words, the elites. It seeks to oppress all who are not of itself. Those who are not of that same spirit. The problem is, however, those under them, under the elites, are all collateral damage. It is a very, very selfish spirit in many ways, and it deals in fear. Matter of fact, fear is the main weapon that it uses to control people and to have its own way. It, it's a type of my will be done spirit. It wants its own will to be done. So it tries to make the people feel like it's looking out for their best interest. We're doing this for you. We want you safe. Look, the Israelites are too numerous, too powerful for us. If war breaks out, they will side up with our enemies and they will fight against us and we will be conquered. It is us. It is you, your children, your families, your grandmas. The best thing to do for you is we want to keep you safe. We want to do it for you. So let us kill the baby boys. That's the spirit of Pharaoh. Not only does the spirit of Pharaoh deal in fear, but this spirit does not know Joseph. In other words, it does not acknowledge Joseph. He knows who Joseph is. He just don't acknowledge him. It only knows or it only acknowledges the brothers of Joseph. And their prosperity does not go unnoticed. Their increase does not go unnoticed. Now, I want you to please understand that Joseph is not the Christ. I'm not saying that Joseph is the Christ. I'm saying Joseph is a type of Christ. And if so, the brothers of Joseph would be us, the Christians. The spirit of Pharaoh does not rise up until the brothers of Joseph, who are free to prosper and to contribute to society, when they begin to grow and they begin to increase and they begin to prosper, then the spirit of Pharaoh rises up in order to quench or to quench their prosperity. 
You know, many of the huge companies today were founded by Christians, such as J.C. Penney. Mr. James Catch Penny was born to a Christian family. His father was a no-salary Baptist preacher. His mother was a vibrant Christian woman and a descendant of a genteel Southern family. You know, his staunch Christian upbringing ensured that he never strayed far from his parents' lessons of self-discipline, honor, faith in God, and the Christian ethic of the golden rule. You know, it's said that by the time Mr. Penny died at the age of 95, it's reported that he was reverse tithing, meaning that he tithed 90% and he lived off of the remaining 10%. Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby is an a national arts and crafts store chain with roughly 500 stores in 41 states. According to their website, the company's first mission statement said this, honoring the Lord in all we do by operating the company in a manner consistent with biblical principles. And it ends with this, we believe that it is by God's grace and provision that Hobby Lobby has endured. He has been faithful in the past. We trust him for our future. Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, founded in 1946, has expanded to include more than 1,500 locations in 39 states. Their founder, Truett Cathy, was a devout Southern Baptist. He ran his company on strict Christian principles. Tyson Foods. Tyson Foods, another company founded on Christian beliefs. And the company's core value says that it strives to honor God and be a faith-friendly company. Mary Kay is another Christian store. There are other Christian companies, many others, like Service Masters, whose brands include such companies as Merry Maids, Terminex, American Home Shield. There's Timbaland, Alaska Air, in and out of Burger, and there are many, many, many more that we could name. But the spirit of Pharaoh seeks to destroy such companies. They seek to take down such prosperity. For instance, J.C. Penney. In May 2020, J.C. Penney filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection and was sold September of the same year. Chick-fil-A is painted as a racist company, a bigot, and has refused opening at some locations in its certain universities. And many call for the boycotting of Chick-fil-A, but the Lord has graciously prospered Chick-fil-A. The spirit of Pharaoh seeks to oppress and enslave. In a lot of respect, the spirit of Pharaoh is very communist. It seeks to do the will of the elite. It seeks to do their will at the hurt and peril of everyone else. And it is bent on enslaving the brothers of Joseph and the minority by culling their posterity. How does it seek to do that? Well, it seeks to do that the same way it did it in the time of Moses. That's the same way that it's doing it today. Well, how is that though, you ask? Well, good question. Through killing the baby boys. That is done today through abortion and through homosexuality and transgenderism and politics and even medically. But specifically, we can't say because our video will be taken down and we will be put in time out. But just consider the recent death increases around the world. You know, an estimated 73.6 million babies have been murdered since 1973. 
It is further estimated that 61% of all unintended pregnancies end in abortion. And 29% of all pregnancies, period, end in abortion. That's almost one out of three. You know, to break that down, that is 2,548 abortions per day. A baby is aborted every 34 seconds. Sacrificed. The main focus of our society today, including the U.S. Army, is killing our men by turning them into women and shaming the masculine males. They call it toxic masculinity. Dysphoria is taught to children who are then encouraged to act on their decisions. Young children, young little boys, little girls. I think it would even be fair to say that a war is being waged on males and on masculinity, just like Pharaoh declared war on Israel's males. Look at Exodus chapter 1, verse 15 through 22. Then the king of Egypt said to Pharaoh's midwives, one of whom was named Shiphrah and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwife feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? Let the male children live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile. But you shall let every daughter live. So now, this spirit of Pharaoh has stepped up its efforts, and is trying to make it a medical issue. According to the Mayo Clinic, sex assigned at birth and gender identity are two separate things. Sex assigned at birth is typically made based on external genital anatomy. But gender identity is the internal sense of being male female, or a gender along the spectrum between male and female. People communicate their gender to others through gender expression. This may be done through mannerisms, clothing, and hairstyles. Gender identity develops separately from sexual orientation. People's sexual orientation is related to whom they are attracted to on a physical, emotional, and romantic basis. End of quote. Instead of teaching our children truth, they are now confusing them with lies. So much so that our children don't know right from left, up from down. They are confused because the spirit of Pharaoh is setting out to destroy, conquer, and enslave. It is not the intent of the spirit to totally destroy and annihilate, but to cull, discourage, and confuse the population in order to control and enslave. United we stand, but divided we fall. So make no mistake, the desire of the spirit of Pharaoh is to manage, control, and enslave the population from generation to generation to generation. Now here's the thing. With the spirit of Pharaoh 
on the rise. We must look for a Moses and an Aaron. We must look for a deliverer. Because evil cannot rise without a counterpart of good rising up to conquer. But also vice versa. What I mean is this. Just like when Christ came, the spirit of Antichrist rose up as well. There could not be a spirit of Antichrist without first having Christ. It's evident in the name Antichrist. There will always be good to evil and evil to good until the judgment of Christ comes. When the world is judged and evil is forever banished and thrown into the lake of fire. Please notice with me though, Moses was an imperfect man. The scripture tells us that Moses was slow to speech. All of you believers, I'm talking to you believers, those of you who think that you're too flawed, too inadequate to be used by God, that God cannot use you because you don't have what it takes. You are wrong. In these days and in these times, God is not looking for the perfect. His son was a picture of perfection. Therefore, he doesn't need another perfect son. What God is looking for is a willing heart. So to qualify, all you have to do or all you have to be is willing. God can and will make up your shortcomings. So don't be afraid. Do not hold back. But believe God and believe that he is for you. Believe what he said. Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 18, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Notice, look, look please. The very first thing that God did for Moses was to give him power to perform signs and wonders in the sight of Pharaoh. Look at the very first sign that Jesus gives believers what he said that believers would do. Do you see it? You got it. Cast out demons. This drives people crazy. When you start talking about deliverance, when you start about talking about casting out uh, spirits, when you start talking about driving out demons, even in the church, it drives them crazy for some reason. Nevertheless, deliverance ministries are starting to pop up everywhere. People are starting to walk in the power and in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They're casting out evil spirits. They're driving out demonic spirits. People are getting healed. People are coming out of wheelchairs. People are starting to hear that never heard before and the gospel of peace is being preached to everyone. People, the oppressed, are being freed. They're being delivered by the grace and the power of Almighty God. Murderers and gangbangers are getting saved and are preaching deliverance services right there in the prisons. They even have a name for it. They call it jailhouse salvation. One such prison inmate turned Bible study leader and evangelist said even the prison guards would come to find out when they were having Bible studies because they wanted to attend. But just like when God sent Moses to deliver his people from the hand of Pharaoh and the people rose up against them, the same way that people today, especially if, if persecution arises, 
they'll do the same thing. They'll say, a good God would not let this or that happen to good people, especially to me. I'm his servant. He loves me too much. He'll never let that happen to me. But look at Exodus chapter 5, verse 20 through 21. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came up from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. They have this mindset that God will never even let them so much as to bump their foot against the stone. And when they stub their toe, it's too much for them. They're like, I'm out. I've had enough. I'm out of here. You know, for some reason, people hate deliverance messages. They hate deliverance ministries. They say all manner of evil, and they try their best to shut them down. They would rather fight the demon that is harassing them night and day instead of getting it cast out and going on with a life of freedom. I believe that just before the coming of Jesus, God will send a deliverer, a Moses, and an Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest and Moses' elder brother. Both was from the line of Levi. Moses grew up as a prince, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, I want you to check this out and let's draw a correlation here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellences of him who called you out of darkness into his glorious light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are a royal priesthood. We are royal. We're royal because God has adopted us as sons and daughters. Just like Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and he was royal. We too are adopted royals. Peter said we were royal. We walk in power and anointing because we have been baptized in God's Holy Spirit. Just like Moses came out of the palace, we too have been called out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. We are empowered to perform signs and wonders and miracles and healings and yes, even to raise the dead. Signs and wonders are appearing in the church in these last days. Make no mistake, more and more reports of healings, of deliverances are happening all over the place, especially in the third world countries such as Africa, even some parts of South America. But you know what? It's even happening right here in America. Although we are persecuted, although we are ridiculed, although they say all manner of evil against us, we believe that in the last days, God is for us. We also believe that in the last days, God will stretch out his hand and strike Pharaoh and strike Egypt and bring judgment on them. And then he will deliver us out of Egypt. He will send us and deliver us and deliver, and deliver us out of Egypt. Egypt represents the unrepentant world. Look at this. In the last days, according to Revelation chapter 1, or chapter 9, verse 1 through 6. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened, and with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. 
They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Those are terrible days. Those are vicious days. Those are frightening days. But you know what? God has promised us that they will not have power over us because Jesus has given us his authority. If you walk in his authority, I believe that you will have power over them. Look at what Luke chapter 10 verse 19 says. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and what? Scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall hurt you. But what's the kicker? We have to walk in the power and in the authority of the name of Jesus. It's the name of Jesus because Jesus' name is a strong tower that we run into and we are safe. Scorpions are one of the, uh, the names that Jesus specifically names. And their power, the power of the enemy, cannot and shall not harm us or hurt us because of the name of Jesus, but we gotta walk in his authority. So don't let anybody shame you into walking in that authority. Don't let them discourage you by walking that authority because it's only in the name of Jesus that we have salvation, only in the name of Jesus that we have deliverance, only in the name of Jesus do we have life, do we have victory. Victory in Jesus. My friends, I believe that we're living in the last days. And the spirit of Pharaoh has risen up and has attacked you and me. It has me, it has you, and it has our family in its crosshairs. So let me ask you, are you covered by the blood of Jesus? Are you walking in the authority of his name? Do you run into his name? Because it's a strong tower that you might be safe. Are you operating in the power and in the authority of that name, the name of Jesus, the only son of God? But let me ask you this really important question. Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Have you repented of your sins? Let me tell you, you can't be living in sexual immorality and say you know Jesus. It doesn't work. You got to come out. You got to stop the things that you used to do and turn around from those things. One of those things, a big thing in America is living with each other, not being married. You must turn away from your sexual immoralities. If you want to know who Jesus is, say this prayer with me. Believe it in your heart. And once you say it, that means that you've repented. Therefore, you can't go back to the same situation, those same relationships that you had before. You have to turn away from those. You have to break those off. You have to make it right in the sight of God. Because Jesus is coming back real soon and he will judge you. Here, say this prayer with me. Father, I repent of my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I accept your free gift of life. I accept your free gift of salvation. Help me to recognize what is right and what is wrong. Even if it's not preached, Lord, help me to recognize it. Convict me in spirit that I might know, that I might repent, that I might turn away from it. Help me to live a life pleasing to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, 
You need to turn away from those types of relationships that were not pleasing in the sight of God. Find a Bible-believing church, not one of those progressive churches that anything goes. I'm telling you, not anything goes. There's a right way, there's a wrong way. Read your Bible, find out for yourself what Jesus expects of you. Because when, when he comes back, he comes back to judge the world. And he's going to be judging you on what's written in his word. So it behooves you to find out what it is that he's coming back to judge you on. Read that Bible every day. Highlight those verses that's meaningful. Highlight those verses that helps you in times of temptation. Because there will be temptation, make no mistake. It's not going to be a life of ease just because you've repented, just because you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's not going to be a life of ease. That's when the devil comes against you. That's when the enemy tries to take you down. That's when you have troubles. But praise the Lord, Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. I want you to find yourself a Bible-believing church who teaches these things. Join that church. And when that 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 uh when Jesus comes back to, to collect those who's waiting for him, because he's coming back to get us real soon. When he comes back, he'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. And he'll say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. And there will be with it for all eternity. Eternity is a long time. Begin to pray. Pray for your family that their eyes would be open as well. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. And, and send us a note. If you have received Jesus for the first time, send us a little notice that you've received Jesus. It'll be an encouragement to us. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kenny. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.